Hello, my friends. This is life coach Mike Trugman, and welcome to an episode of Mike's Search for Meaning. I'm after some big questions. Why are we here? What makes a fulfilling life? How can we grow individually and collectively? Each episode, I'll dive deep with leaders who are doing great work in the world and see how they organize their life. Books read, value systems, resources used, and stories that show how each of you can create the life and the world of your dreams. All right, Jim, it it is so nice to be with you. And and we've already been together for about 20 minutes. And that I was saying before we jumped on, a, a part of me wishes that we recorded what we were speaking about because it was it was really meaningful and I, I'm just I'm I'm really grateful that you're here I'm, I'm excited to see you know where this conversation goes and unfolds so thanks for joining Mike Search for Meaning yeah thanks Mike great to be with you and I'm feeling that too that previous conversation uh, just put me in the great mood and happy to be with you and see where we'll go today mm-hmm. well the place that I wanted to start with you. I I actually haven't read your version of it, but you you have an essay, or I, I don't know what you would call it. It's it's called the Journey of Transformation, mm. and mm-hmm. there's a there's a diagram of a big U. Yeah, and I I think that where I want to start is twofold. I I would love to hear you break down your view. It, it rhymes a lot with the hero's journey, from my understanding. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Of, uh-huh. uh, yeah. What the journey of transformation is. Yeah. And I would also love to hear a little bit about your journey of transformation. I know mm-hmm. there's there's many layers to that, but maybe we just start with the the essay and if you were breaking it down for for someone who's unfamiliar with yeah. your essay or the journey or, or rather the hero's journey. We'll sure you bet. So, um maybe a good place to start is just to imagine that you're looking at a graphic that looks like a U, presents as a U and it, with a little tail on the front side, the beginning, and the tail on the far side as well. And um, what I'll also say before we get into the details is uh, what I'm about to describe isn't really something new from my perspective. Um, What it is, is kind of an amalgamation of a number of perspectives that have existed for quite some time, including some really old ones. Um, And So that would include the hero's journey. It it would also include uh, William Bridges has done work that talks about the human experience of going through transitions with endings, the wilderness, and then new beginnings. And then Otto Scharmer um, and Theory U uh, presents something quite similar too. Um, But what what I feel like I've done is I've taken taken into account all of those and um, my own experience in uh, for, for myself personally, but also in coaching and guiding people, particularly um, on wilderness programs where it'd be a Western contemporary approach to say a vision quest, where people are going through transformational change. And um, I've been thinking of, about, well, what's it really like? Uh, not just, not really even the logic of it, but what's the human experience of it? And if we could map it out, maybe we could support it better. And um, for many, as uh, we go through what I'm about to share, it's kind of helpful to know that there's a there there, that what I'm going through, you know, isn't just um, my own kind of going off the radar into my own experience from, you know, the radar of the rest of the human population. You know? But no, it's it's quite something that's incredibly natural and it can be well supported. And um, it's it's super helpful to to lean in here. So I feel like it's more of a, a superset of models rather than something um, in, innovative or importantly new. It's it's innovative in that it just acknowledges all of this. So um, back to that graphic you in the beginning, it's almost as if um, life's just going on, you know, and um, we're tending to the things that need to uh, need our attention until we come up to a place where I like to think of it as a, there's a, a question or an inquiry or something that's demanding our attention that's tapping at our shoulders. And what we'll um, traditionally do is we'll turn to those things and lean in and we'll bring our awareness of what has helped us in previous experiences like this. We'll use our old ways of knowing, which are, if they're of service, great. You know, if they help resolve the question, great. But sometimes those questions aren't going to go away. There's a lot of poetry, you know, that's out there that supports that and turning towards those questions that will not go away. And so uh, there's, now we start to get to the, top of the U before we start dropping down. And there's an area that 
if there, we have a graphic, you'd see it as a, a bit of a spiral and it's, it's a moment of refusal. And um, it's to say, it's not like we're actively saying no. Um, it's, it's, it, I feel like the experience is more one of, yeah, this is a niggly. I wish it weren't here. I'm going to see if, and then fill in the blank, <laughs> you know, if I can maybe get, put my attention elsewhere and well, we will try what we already know how to do in, in order to bring our life back into something that feels like normal. Um, but as I said, sometimes those things just will not bring a resolution. Um, and if they don't, we we come to a place where I feel like there's a threshold to be crossed. And that threshold is one of actually acknowledging that this is something that is actually demanding my attention. And I am going to give it more awareness than what I've done up to this point and have it come directly into my view. And at that point, what I feel happens experientially is it's as if we are really crossing a threshold because up until this point, I've tried to imagine that it's not there or I've held it as not there. That thing that's not there, I've been holding as not here. <laughs> and then crossing the th threshold, I become aware of something I can no longer be unaware of. And so there's no going back. It's it's a now I'm I'm in it. Um, and just to ground it and maybe help listeners check for themselves if they've had moments like this in their own lives. You know, it, these things can be things like um, they present as a crisis only in that I don't know how to approach it. But they don't necessarily need to present as a negative life instance. It's just. Um, I'm in a place where I haven't been, been been before, and that presents its own crisis. So on the one hand, it can be the loss of a loved one and going through grief and what is life like now um, in the absence of, of that or a different presence of that, all of the things. Um, I'm even sensitive to the wording because I'm not trying to presuppose what's beyond. The only way to do that is to step over the threshold and go see for yourself. But Loss of a loved one is, a, is an easy event to talk about. You know, it, p listeners could look back um, in their own lives and see what it was like to leave home for the first time, whether you were leaving for a loved one, a job, a university, uh, whatever that might have been. Uh, we can think about things, but then they happen and they present something beyond what we're um, intellectually understanding. Um, sometimes, though, it can be things like, hey, I just sold a company. and uh, financially, I'm doing really well. And there are so many that would look at my life and say, I should be incredibly happy. But here I am with all these things that feel like abundance, but um, I'm actually not happy. And, and I don't know um, whether that's even okay. Um, and so all the questions come up. Um, so there can be a variety of things, but maybe just mentioning these few can help people kind of search for their own and start to connect with these things. So we cross over this threshold. Then the next move in the graphic is to uh, go down. And part of that in the graphic is to also help represent kind of um, a descent. It's, it's, a, it's a time of shedding um, what is no longer of service. Um, and here I feel like um, really valuable work to look at what it is ending, um, which is very different from what should end. If we start to approach this as what should or shouldn't, it's as if our understanding of things as they are is now driving the bus and we are guided by, we're trying to take control is really the deal. And, and that's understandable, but trying to take control is to try to have things work out with the way I already under, understand them to be. But this opportunity presents something more than that. It's not just different. It's something beyond that. You're not going to lose your understanding. You're going to gain additional insight that you can't think your way through to. And that's part of the experience of, of this, this whole journey. Um, so what is ending? Sometimes it's helpful to think about what is here to shed. Um, what has come to um, its close as if it were a chapter? Something that was of service in previous days or years or eras of your life that is no longer actually of service. And um, to bring your attention, to inquire in, into what is ending, um, what's what's dead, um, helps to come into a greater clarity of what is no longer here with you. And you can hear the present tense of is ending or has ended, as opposed to what may or might. It's, it's just to be with what is. 
so coming down, there's the uh, the shedding of skins, the uh, releasing and letting go of previous aspects of our life. Um, there's there's also an opportunity to open with as if you were had the eyes of a newborn into what's around you. You know what's what's bringing you alive right now. Can can I be so curious to uh, let myself be drawn to something that's here? And what is super helpful as a guide uh, supporting others in this this kind of journey is to uh, what I love to do is I think of it as longing. Um, is there a notion or a sense of longing for the that the individual may be carrying at this time? And it's not the the noun of what they are longing for that matters. It is actually the the longing itself. It's more the verb um, because in the longing there's a a move towards vitality of some some sort. There's a richness that's there, and it's incredibly personal and unique. And so, um, coming to explore longing um, can be super valuable and help to move things along without knowing outcomes. <laughs> um, so there's a chance of uh, going out and you'd see if you were to look at this graphic, you know, um, something that would refer to as learning journeys, you know, like. Where might I go to better understand those things that somehow present as compelling to me at this time in my life? I don't need to know even what that would mean in the longer term. I just notice it as that seems awesome or really cool or I wonder what, you know, um, to, and the, the idea of going out into new places opens up the possibility of having new experiences, not just new content, but, but new experiences that, um, it, as it says if the container of life itself is getting getting broader so those are some of the key things that are happening as we're moving down um, the u and um what i might say as we move down and approach um what might be the the lower loop of of the u um by the time we start to enter into that lower loop and I'm, by the way, I'm very aware I'm presenting this as this is incredibly linear and step by step, <laughs> but it, it's not that it is. The map is not the territory, you know, yes. um, but as we get down there, um, what's also happened by the time we come down to the lower U, there's actually been likely been a fair amount of grieving. Um, the, the loss and acknowledgement of what has been can sometimes be bittersweet. Sometimes it presents as relief and release. Um, but coming down to that lower part of that you, uh, we're coming to see more clearly and have um, processed in many ways, and digested um, and, and leaned into grief itself. Um, and with that, we're also opening our hearts to be more open um, because we've gone through that journey. And that's part of the deal of, we've experienced our way into this. We haven't thought our way in, into this. And um, so at the bottom of the you, there's, um, there's a place of being in between, you know, William Bridges would talk about this as the neutral zone or the, the wilderness uh, from a quest perspective. It's the time of the solo fast of the, of the solo time itself. Um, theory, you would say this is the retreat and to um, be calm and silent. It's, it's a, it's an opportunity for one to really come to see quite directly. Um, where are they at this moment? And what is coming up? Um, and where are they in what is coming up? It's, it's, it's importantly personal and individual. Um, things, it's almost um, more like an alchemy has been happening to uh, move things to this place. Um, and there was the, uh, almost like the chemical reactions were needed rather than the mathematical problem solving, you know, to, to get into this uh, awareness. But being in stillness, um, it just helps to ground, provide a sense of individual grounding. Um, and I think it's also important that in these these um, often very intense journeys, um, being able to know that there is grounding, um, that you can feel your own sense, and it's not somebody something that somebody can tell you, uh, but to, somebody can support you. And um, so coming from the you, which is like coming out of the solo experience, um, there's often an awareness of some things that are presented new. Sometimes they're very new, but the but sometimes we can look over our shoulder and see, oh, there's this thing, this this aspect of my life. 
that um, has been here for quite some time, but now I'm actually oriented in a very different way. So it's not the noun again, it's my own relationship uh, to my own identity and my sense of myself in the world around me. And with some insights that are coming at this point, I, I feel like they, they're presenting as um, almost guides themselves, elements of my life that are offering uh, a, a sense of direction without an answer. Um, an idea of what might be the next most obvious step without knowing the destination. And so if we lean into that, we can start crossing another threshold. And this threshold for me is one where uh, we are acknowledging uh, something that is new, but, but actually clear in here. It, it is of me and it is me. Um, and, and it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, sometimes um, I've, what I've seen and experienced with guiding folks on quests we can get come to the end of the journey of being out together in the wilderness and it's been moving, but then if they end up going back <laughs> and back means <laughs> going back into the life they had been in, um, it can be painful uh, to not affirm some of the shifts that have been happening and actually start to act in, um, in alignment with those. And the, the painful part can bring up a sense of malaise, um, a, a questioning of what did I really go through and can I even trust that? There, It's understandable. It's almost like um, a survival's last stand, you know, a survivor's last stand and, and, and a, an orientation of what is coming to a close. And I'd rather not have it come to a close. But if we cross this threshold and start to take actions that are of integrity, of, of the new way, uh, which includes the new emerging me if we if i act in accordance um i'll feel that alignment and then it can be on the, it's this um kind of double-edged sword of it's it can be exhilarating and terrifying <laughs> at the same time because i haven't been here before so crossing that threshold i'm acknowledging and affirming that and i start to go up then uh, the you and in doing that i start to re-engage with the world around me i'm not I didn't go back. I, I may have gone towards familiar territory. It might be my same address, my same home, but um, there might even be a different sense of feeling, you know. It, so again, verbs, not nouns. <laughs> you know, it's it's you're coming forward in, into your life, and um, what's it like now? And there's the tending to that and learning and gaining momentum, and that kind of takes us up to the top of the U and moving further into life until the next one comes up. <laughs> yeah. So I, there's a, a immediate reflection I have, and then I, yeah. I would love to overlay your story. I mean, sure. There, the, of course, there's there's various iterations probably, but what, what I'm particularly pointing yeah. to with you is, is I know you got to a certain point in your career at Hewlett Packard, and yeah. after some time in Italy with, uh, I think it was with your family, yeah. You you eventually came to I'm going to go to Pakistan and be in the mountains for two months and right. I, I imagine there was there was a certain level of I both know exactly why I'm supposed to be here and I have no idea why I'm supposed to be here and yeah and kind of like where does that unfold to that yeah that certainly goes on this this arc of the you that you're that you totally you beautifully outlaid uh a quick reflection I have because I I was mm -hmm. sitting with maybe. Like where, where has this happened in my own life? And yep. maybe do, does everyone go through this? And I, and I think the answer is probably yes to the latter, that, that everyone goes through it. And I, I was actually thinking about COVID as this really kind of global yep. experience of this is the way we are, we are all just kind of going in, in some way in our life. And then COVID happens and it disrupts the entirety of life as we know it. And I heard lots of different reactions to, uh, to what happened with COVID. And may maybe important to put in here, of course, when, when people are dealing with life and death, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, people who were confronted with like the real illness and uh, damage that COVID did. But right. many of us who are, who are privileged enough, we, we had the opportunity to say, well, I'm kind of being brought into my cocoon here. What, what do I, what's, what's going to happen yep. next? And two of the many reactions that I saw were either this really big longing and yearning for the world to just go back to what it was, whatever that right. really meant to, to whoever was saying that. 
And another was, well, what, where do we get to step into? I know there's going to be a time beyond COVID and, and like, what, what will the world or what will I, or who will I become? And, uh, I guess there's, there's no right or wrong, but it's, it's just really, it's really interesting yep. the way that all of these, there's so many invitations in our own life or even globally for us to place ourselves like where are we in our life right now how, how do we yeah. orient to what what the content of of our life or the world is right now yeah and uh that's yeah you know, even if someone who's listening right now is not sitting with the i'm at this crossroads in my life of like what's next in my career or in my yeah. love life uh the universe throws a million of these things our way <laughs> that's right so, yeah 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 so in, in your life, Jim, I, I've already kind of outlaid the, the yeah. bullet points high level of, of how your at least this particular version of, of your uh, journey yep. of transformation unfolds, but I would love to hear you speak to it. Yep. Be before we do that, I'm happy to do that. Uh, before we go there, could I just, could we build on what you were just sharing? Because I Absolutely. think that you brought up some really, really helpful uh, points. So, it, you know, one of the questions that I heard there was, um, do we all move through something like this? And um, what what I feel and believe is there it, um, is I think we're all, all presented with, with the opportunity uh, to go mm -hmm. through this, to go through something like this, substantial. And sub what is substantial is to be measured and understood at the individual's level, not, not mine. Um, it's how significant was it to you? Um, but what while we each we'll have opportunities uh, for this and opportunities you know, that word may not feel like what's going on at, at times, you know? Um, I think in, in some cases, um, people will work really hard not to go, go through this. And, and um, I don't think that's a right or wrong thing. I, I feel like we're always trying to do the best with what we have to work with. And uh, it's just from that orientation. Uh, what do we, what do we do with what we're presented with? And so when I, when I have, as I've thought about that question, um, I think one of the things that helps to decide whether somebody went through something with that kind of depth of shift, I'll say, is to what degree ha has the structures and rules of understanding of who I am in the world and my orientation to the world around me, to what degree has that actually si shifted? Um, and if it hasn't shifted that much, and I have been able to go through big, amazing, or terrible things, um, who's to say that's right or wrong? You know, it, it, it's been of service, however it's been of service. Um, but it, it is helpful to know and to consider, and this is where I think of it as a sweaty palm moment of like, oh, maybe it's going to be amazing, but maybe I really don't want to do this, you know, is... Uh, and my palms start to sweat, just even considering, you know, this, this question is, it, it's helpful to, to be aware from time to time, if you're presented with these things, that there actually might be a different way, but it might ask you to leave behind some of what has actually supported you to get to here. Would you be curious to lean into that and, what, and, to, and to go explore what might come of that? Um, that's when the palms start to sweat. So I, and I feel like those at the individual level, that's kind of a marker, you know, of, oh, yeah, well, it might be in a moment <laughs> to, to actually lean into this. And to be supported is also a helpful thing. Some pe sometimes we're not, and we're, we're going to do the best we can. And oftentimes we'll use what has carried the day in the past. So I, I just want to call that out, that we may not go through, and it, it, that's okay. It, it's more of there's a there there that may be of an opening your life to help bring even more and more perspective and awareness into it. So that that's uh, what was coming up um, there for that one. There's a poem. It's a um, prospective immigrants take note. And I can't remember who wrote that. I'm sure some listeners are going, I know, <laughs> but um, the, the, the short version of the poem speaks to the opening of a door and you can pass through um, this door but the door is only a door. And if you pass through, your life may change for amazing ways. But if you don't pass through, you will also have your life, you know? So it, it, I feel like there's, there's something that's almost like that in play. Mm -hmm. 
I, so I can head towards if you'd like the the um, the question that you had asked earlier of like and I was I was just if I I drifted for yeah, yeah. like ten seconds there I was trying to see if I could get the the author of that poem and I think is yeah. it Adrienne Rich is that correct It is Yep that's Adrienne the one Rich. Yep So I yep. wanted to make sure we yep. closed that loop because I I'll, yep. wanna, I'll link to that in the show notes for sure I yep. Yeah I would I would love to continue with your yeah I, I you know i think there's there's a few curiosities that we'll we'll probably get back to at some point in the conversation but would love to hear a little bit about your your journey with hewlett packard your time in the yeah. mountains of pakistan etc et yeah so um i think it's helpful then to start a little bit upstream before when things really started to heat up um so at that point in my career uh it was a couple of decades ago, but it's pretty rich time in my life. Um, my wife and I and two kids uh, had been living in Italy. Uh, part of what I was doing in, in, um, in Italy was helping to start up a new division within Hewlett Packard. Uh, we had lived there for just under five years and the time was coming to a close and we were going to move back to Colorado, uh, back to the, the home we had left and had kept um, while we were in Italy. And um, before we left, my wife and I had, had had a conversation about, hey, this has been an amazing experience, um, and we're about ready to go back to Colorado and pick up our lives again. It might be helpful to get some time aside and really take a look at well, where do we want to go? You know, what what's, what's actually happened? And um, while we while we had those intentions, <laughs> when we got back. Um, we just got busy again, and uh, I was I was involved with a merger and acquisition that had been um, underway, and uh, I also spent a fair amount of time going between Boulder and Santa Monica, uh, where the uh, the merger was taking place of this recent acquisition. And um, what what I was realizing as the months started to pass was. Um, I was very involved with uh, my work. I, I loved it, and I loved to learn. But I was also feeling more distant from my family. And um, even talking about it right now seems overly simplistic. That, that I was just aware that, that uh, this probably wasn't quite in alignment with how I'd like to live if I could know what, know what that was, you know, that there's something kind of off. Um, and then I, I got to this place where um, I just realized I, I'm too far in. I'm I'm working and committed in a way where I can't see it from where I am. And um, I was talking with my wife about that and said, you know, I just I need to get a break. Um, and so I I stopped. I, I had a great um, supporting manager at HP at the time. And I said I I just need some time off and to see a big picture again. Mm. And um, it was also a convenient move in some of the business things. So I wasn't leaving something in the lurch. It was just rather than going on to the next thing, a whole lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, well, go ahead, you know, take some time. So I took three months off and I spent two of those months. Um, I love the mountains and I knew I, what I felt like I needed was to get a different clue. <laughs> um, I, I didn't know anything about which were to come. I just knew I loved nature and I loved mountains and I wanted to do something that didn't feel like I was a tourist, but I also wasn't in a place where I felt like going on some retreat would really carry the day. I needed to move. I needed to move my body. I needed to exercise and almost like blow something out, but also um, work my way into being here, you know, to, to really being present. So I did what most normal people would do is go to Pakistan. <laughs> of course. So, yeah, it's obvious. You know, so <laughs> I, um, I took advantage of a, a track that was uh, going to be happening. It was called the um, Grand Karakoram Traverse. And um, it was uh, a, a, an amazing uh, trek of going through the mountain ranges that on some of the most beautiful, I feel, parts of the Himalayan range. Um, so the site of K2 and some other just beautiful, large peaks. 
but it wasn't about um it wasn't about accomplishment you know it wasn't about how big are these mountains it was more of i want to just be really in it and, and be kind of direct in it so the idea you wake up in the morning you start walking <laughs> do that for a few weeks say you know it was it was great and I, I realized that um, looking over my shoulder, looking into that from the future, looking towards the past, I, I feel like I went there for the mountains, but but um, what I came away with, with a great appreciation for was my own place in life in, in a way where um, the magnitude of the mountains helped me to really feel what it was to be a part of something much bigger than, than I had really come to grips with, actually. Uh, and there wasn't anything wrong that I had been doing. It was just more of an opening into there's just so much more actually and so you know how, how do you really want to live um and um going through uh, each day there's a simplicity you know it, um there were others on the trek of course and i became friends with a number of them one in particular where we spent most of our time together, a gentleman from south africa and uh, we laughed hard and told stories and just kept kept going and asked questions and um but it's it's as if the walking itself helped us to come into our own pace in where life was uh, at, at the time and then so in a way uh, kind of linking it back to that journey of transformation um and the graphic the upper part if i pause for a second catch where things are in terms of that, that journey itself. Um, I had been in denial um, when I came back home to Colorado uh, from Italy. The denial of something bigger trying to get my attention um, was my moving into the next thing and just getting busy and being fed by that, but also kind of feeling a question that's not going away. And then, then seeing there's something there that's the crossing of the threshold for me, which was then um, heading towards and being in more of a direct relationship with the questions themselves. And then choosing to go on the trip to the mountains um, was to go right in it. And then to then each day without knowing or having a structured approach to endings, I was just in many ways kind of partially an inquiry, you know, of like, where am I? And so I mean, quite literally, but also like, what isn't going forward? What am I actually done with? Uh, what, am, what am I, what am I becoming aware of that the awareness brings um, insight into, I can't live this way anymore. You know, live, live with these things in the way I had been. Not, not in an aggressive way, but more of like um, an affirmational way. Like this, this much is true. Um, and then, being out there for the extent of time and walking and being in that rhythm for quite some time was almost like the ability to be in the bottom of that view to just just be and to see you know what matters uh what where am i with respect to what matters. and so there there was a part where i started to see my relationship with my family you know quite quite differently it wasn't dramatically different um, but it was importantly different um and I, I came to see how important it was for me to spend regular time in nature, you know, as, as well. And to, I could, I learned and could see um, that, you know, in some ways, I, if, if not, I don't know if I do this clinically, I'm not qualified to do that, but if I wasn't a workaholic, I certainly had workaholic tendencies. And um, to then be able to more consciously be making choices of what's the level of commitment engagement I want to have. And to not just be structured to hold back from that, but to act, actively make an active choice of if I'm not doing that, I'm actually living more, you know, and in the way I'd like to, I'm actually choosing to live more, which then has me uh, be a little bit more conscientious of where healthy boundaries might, might be. Um, and so coming, um, coming out from the mountains, I was still in Pakistan and it was, um, there's a turbulence there, you know, it was, more people, more uh, noise, more movement. And after being out like that, it's quite common, of course, for those who have been 
in retreats, silent meditations, or even just times in nature where there's been something substantial. Getting to an airport and hearing what's going on there, you know, could be just like an, an overload of, of stimulation. So we came back into some smaller villages and that thing stood out. I mean, it was it was bright, sparkly, uh, loud, uh, not intentionally so. It wasn't aggressive, but man, it, it was a lot. And so in, it was nice to have uh, the ability to go from small village to small village before hopping on, you know, buses that took us back to major cities and then onto airports. Um, so th that too is kind of like coming through the bottom of the unit, heading up into, um, well, now you're coming back into life in a way, into more of society, into more of what's really around and, and with more intentionality of how to actually be here. Um, and so I, I did take from that trip, um, what I would later recognize as an experience that could kind of easily map, you know, into that, that graphic and then became a bit of a, a basis when I went on to guide, um, and solo fast on my, on my own and with co-guides as well. Um, yeah, that's, to bring up any questions or anything that yes. might be helpful. Okay. <laughs> definitely. I mean, I definitely, I mm -hmm. want to spend some time or a, a really good chunk of time talking about the way that you facilitate and guide wilderness quests now, because I think that's a, it's a really powerful vehicle of transformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that stood out to me in your story, I, it, it can yeah. be helpful to zoom in. There's, yeah. th there are probably a couple of pivotal moments uh, based yeah. on what you shared with me there. And there was something, this is a really interesting insight that you brought up is that you were aware that you didn't want to do a, a retreat or uh, yeah, like to, to go on some guided experience in the States or you know wherever else you might go to seek solace and to help you get clarity. Right. There was, there was this knowing in you, it, it wasn't exactly the words you used, but you said you wanted, yeah. you knew you wanted to move your body and that you love the mountains. And I'm just, I'm curious if we zoom in on that, how that showed up for you. Like how, how did you know that or, or what That's indicated a great question. for you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I definitely wasn't tracking this at the time in the way that I've been able to talk about it now. So it, now looking back, um, I think what I was using as a bit of a guide, uh, there were things that seemed like a fit and things that weren't. And, and, and the felt sense of that or the intuitive sense, it wasn't the logic or the math. So um, my time um, my time in the mountains prior to deciding to go on that trip, um, I had actually spent a fair amount of time I used to climb a lot, right? rock and ice and and there I, I i always loved what my feelings my experience of just being out and being with the mountains it, and the routes were neat too yeah it, it didn't matter whether you made it to the top it was just it was more than just climbing but climbing brought me there you know and so i i felt like it was important to kind of move towards that kind of state is what I, I feel like was there. And I think that also helped to reinforce the, the need that I felt I had to move my body because I knew what it felt like to move my body, and particularly in the mountains. And um, so all of those things were things that felt right. Um, the things that seemed, um, which I did consider, things that seemed like uh, that I had available to me if I wanted, you know, I could, I could call together friends and we could look at approaching where I was from an understanding of strategy, you know, and start laying things out and come up with some choices and options or scenarios and see what was compelling about those. I mean, and, and that felt like, you know, I could do that, uh, but that wasn't scratching the itch, you know, um, or the other things that had to do with more like um, retreats or a particular program. Um, I didn't have an awareness of things like quests at that point. Didn't know really what they were, if they were still offered. Anyway. But what I did know, um, I, it's, it's the, the idea of being in a silent retreat or 
uh, doing something where if, I, if it were predominantly meditation, um, it, it just felt like this, this need to move my body um, and to do that in ways that would drain me physically um, felt like an important thing. So it was just kind of saying yes to the things that seemed right and then to play around with uh, options and to see what, what stood out in the discernment. Um, and that too is helpful for supporting people now. You know, actually, if it's not something, what do you know it is about that not fit? <laughs> you know, what yes. might that suggest? You know, so uh, I didn't know any of that you know, when I was doing it. Um, and then the other thing that, was there, I think was that sweaty palm thing too, of like, wow, would I seriously consider taking a trip to go to Pakistan and be in the middle of nowhere? And it's like, part it's like, oh, that sounds great in a number of ways. And by the way, all this was taking place prior to 9-11. And I met some amazing, wonderful people, you know, in, in, in Pakistan. It's just, I have a ton of appreciation, you know, still there. It's, um, that was a that was a gift from from being in that part of the world too. So, yeah, that's and it gives. It, yeah. So with your share, it, while of course it, it it kind of forces your your own reflection of like, hmm, how did I make that choice? I, I think it gives a clue into uh, one of my curiosities when I'm asking that question is how can I, you know, if I'm at these crossroads of um, I know I I've, I've created an opening in my life of of some kind and. I don't know how I want to spend time during that opening. It gives it gives some breadcrumbs for you know how yeah. how would I maybe how would I consider making a choice like that? And it's really interesting. A, a common thread I hear from a lot of people who've made important choices like that in their life is that they played around in some way. It sounds like you did. You played around with whatever the the options that were available to you at that time. Yeah. Like, do I want to strategize? Eh, I don't know. Like that that could be yeah. helpful. And, get a lot of ideas but that doesn't really feel like it i could yep. do a silent retreat uh, i don't know you know like i i feel called yep. to like no that's the thing i would want at the silent retreat is to like get a, get around and have my body be fully exhausted and so uh you know slowing down enough to take time to consider what what would i want or what's not working about the thing that isn't working is uh, yeah i i don't think i spend enough time with that in, in my own life and Mm -hmm. it, it can be really easy to try and find the answer in your head and uh yeah. and can be really challenging to sit with the having the curiosity is what was like what's behind the no there or what what would be behind the yes yeah and, uh, yeah really really interesting way to to break it down yep i'm okay. very interested in if there's any other reflections you have i'm i'm here for them but i, I i'm very interested to hear the way that you look at your role as a, a wilderness guide and, and maybe as a facilitator of experiences like that, like kind of what are the, what are the ingredients that go into, I guess there's lots of different things, right? What, what's the container? How long mm -hmm. typically are you working with folks? Uh, what, what type of activities are you doing or not doing? You know, like what, what are, what are uh, people getting themselves enrolled into if yeah. they're, if they're not doing a wilderness quest? So I, um, I think one of the important ingredients right at the very beginning, um, where if this ingredient isn't there, it kind of doesn't matter <laughs> uh, what's on tap or what's the offer. It's the person themselves, you know, it's the, I think of this as readiness, uh, just, just, or ripe, you know, um, it, it's, it's where are they in their life right now? How are they, uh, kind of in relationship to whatever might be cooking? And whatever they're making of that gives all sorts of important signs and signals of um, would would this wilderness um, time be of support um, and having a better sense for where they are at the moment also helps to give some guidance as to, well, what kinds of experiences might really be support too. So, um, you know, that that is the just to, this kind of builds on what you're saying earlier that people listening now um one of the things that you, that you could do from a very practical perspective is kind of just get curious and to turn towards where things are at the moment and just notice hey are you are you caring um 
any sometimes I think of them as nigglies. You know, just they're irritants or some things that just aren't going away. You know, is there anything that's trying to get your attention and what happens when you do bring your attention to them and however they present. Um, sometimes I feel like um, turning towards feelings and what's your felt experience uh, in this time and to get curious about those without needing to fix um, anything is, is super, super helpful. So what are you feeling? You know, how long have you been feeling that? Where in your body are you feeling that? Um, if that feeling had words, uh, what might it express at this time? Um, especially if there's something that has been there for quite some time um, that maybe hasn't been getting attention. Um, I, I get really curious if there seems to be something like that uh, presenting. Um, so it doesn't need to be understood in some logical sense. It, it's it's there. There's just something almost like a low drumbeat sometimes can can be there that can be quite helpful. And I feel like feelings, it's almost like other ways of knowing um, can be very, very helpful in, in providing those clues and provide some guidance as to what might be a helpful experience. So um, turning towards the things that uh, might happen, um, there, there are a number of different components in the way that I hold uh, you know, this particular journey done done in nature um, that I feel are helpful. One is to um, give the person who is going through the experience a very real and felt sense of they're making the choices. It, it is all opt-in each step of their way. So even while I might have a structure or my co-guide and I might have a structure, and by the way, most of the time I'm with a co-guide uh, just for safety reasons and for a variety of perspectives. Uh, it's super helpful. Um, key key part um, that to know that you can decide uh, this doesn't seem to be a fit and something else is here, but still be in it. You know, there's a way that a guide can actually support you with that. It's the, what I feel is here is the importance of supporting the individual in their experience which is different from saying the important thing is supporting the program structure <laughs> or, or what we have on tap for the day or something like that. You know? And so while there is a structure and there are things that, that are being offered, um, those things can be modified to, to fit and make best uh, use of the, the individual's reality where, the, where things are in the time we have to go. So um, even, even having a ceremony right at the very beginning that um, supports the person making an intentional commitment to be here in this for the next few days, you know, that's, that can be seemingly simple, but it's a very real choice and um, that can, that brings up things and can, can be helpful. The, the other, uh, other things, um, kind of mapping them in a similar way against that graphic of that you, um, they include things like um, even before we come together of uh, leaning into questions around what might be ending? Uh, what are you noticing about endings? Uh, what comes up when you do use these different words like shedding or dying? Um, and what feelings, uh, what stories um, come up? Um, I actually love working with dreams. Um, I feel like dreams often present um, insight material that dreams i feel don't care what you're thinking or where you are <laughs> it's just here you go so um doing dream work in a way where the individual is able to take advantage of the experiences that were presented during the, the dream time and to engage them more directly uh, in the waking hours uh, sometimes that uh, often not even sometimes you know, that starts to unearth uh, some things that are here uh, to be attentive to um, and then finding ways of being attentive to them. Um, that could be, you know, things like having conversations on and with the land, um, being with dream characters in different ways on the land. Um, here too, uh, I feel uh, this is taking two steps back and a bigger kind of independent of the programs. Um, I feel often sometimes we get to stuck places from um, having missed an opportunity to imagine and, and to in, engage 
imagination. And, and so having time in nature to let yourself, now using the word dream in a different way, you know, dream into an amazing um, life that's outrageously compelling. It's, it's actually an act of, I feel, courage to, to do that. And using the word daring is not too strong of a word. To dare to imagine living with vitality. You know, it just, it, it gives permission to be able to do that. It, it's, it's to even recognize, it might be edgy, but like if you were to just imagine what comes up right now, even listen, you know, to the feelings, the brightness, the tingly fingers, um, what words come next? They don't even have to make sense. What words come next, yeah? So there too, um, I find this super helpful. This has been something I've, um, been aware of over the years it's, it's following that thread of longing to then um, support imagination and other ways of knowing where I might connect with a positive picture of a compelling future for me in, in a not heady way however it happens I didn't I didn't make a path to get to the future but then I talk about it I go out into the future and I let it I turn the knobs to 11 and let it happen and just feel it ripping through and tell me about what's going on there, you know? And to be able to have that experience and then to notice what what are we learning and discovering about vitality that might be there um, and have the future inform the present then at that point um, is often super helpful, you know, too, and fun. You know, it's, it's, it's rewarding. Um, so, um, other things that th there's a whole wide variety that come from different schools in some ways. Um, but, but having nature as a guide and, and having it be not just an experience in the context of nature, but to be with nature and to, to be in conversation, to be of what is nature, um, to notice that we may feel lonely, but we are not alone, um, that we are we were born good enough. <laughs> this don't need to uh, perform our way into presenting ourselves as as worthy in the natural world. Um, we're just offered again and again and again a chair to claim <laughs> at the seat of the table, <laughs> and um, sometimes we can uh, get disconnected from that. And um, so I feel nature has this hugely important role on multiple levels um, to be there uh, with us and to uh, offer guidance in direct conversations, speaking out loud kinds of conversations to, and uh, take in what, what's coming um, from them. I've heard, I don't know if you're familiar with Simon Sinek, but he, he says frequently, uh, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. Yeah, and, you know, that that's seems great. that's like one of that's really mm -hmm. one of the things that's echoing yeah. in this conversation so far is that uh, a lot of times when we are at a crossroads, it is because we are in our head about how to strategize or think our way into the next thing, and if we if that's the only tool we've got in our arsenal and we haven't developed the ability uh, the ability to feel into it or to sense or to intuit whatever might be next, then it's yeah. it's unlikely that we are going to arrive at or or at the best we might just stumble into it by thinking right. our way into a thousand things and trying and then feeling but anyway yeah that that yeah. was certainly coming up for me and i i knew that you uh that you facilitated this exercise uh, i i forget exactly what you said it's called uh, around basically having conversations with it, an element of the land or an element yeah. of nature, right? It could be a squirrel, yeah. it could be a rock, it could be the mountain range. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's any uh, personal or if you'd be willing to share you know, an attendee's experience of what that's like, because it sounds, well, to me, it doesn't sound very outlandish because I, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of a, a deep dive into this type of work and it feels like, wow, of course, having a conversation with this tree or with the mountain could be really profound, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for a lot of times, if we if we haven't, if we're not familiar with what that is, having an example to hang our hat on can be helpful. So, well, maybe I'll, I'll do 
two different things here. One is to just lay out an, an exercise and that would be pretty easy, easy to follow, I think. Um, and then uh, share an example or, or, or two to bring it alive. Um, but even in the example, one thing that's super important is to know you kind of can't do this wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, actually, here too, having the freedom to do it your own way, but noticing that what I'll have to offer actually really has been of support for for many across a number of years, and other people who offer the same kinds of guidance and exercises. There's, you will not be the first, and you certainly won't be the last uh, to to do this, and having an overt speaking out loud conversation with with nature speaking with an aspect of the natural world is often something that we know how to do and we did a bunch of when we were kids you know and just mm -hmm. playing outside and and so to to let yourself it's really a letting yourself uh do this from that vantage point um can help you open up to to more of what what might come from this and Another thing to share is what I'm about to offer too. I, I've done with CEOs and founders of companies for years, and oftentimes there can be a bit of skepticism and asking the question, "Did you just say speak out loud?" And it's like, "Yeah," <laughs> you know. And uh, so there can be the the hesitancy, I'll say. Um, and there's one program where we will do this for like four or five straight days um, in the mornings. Um, first thing we do and First day is kind of like, what? You know, and then off we go. By the end of the second day, we're having conversations that are like, so I was talking with this bush and and off of the, it's just like, you know, I just met Sally. You know, it's it's okay. You know, so it, it, if you can let it be that easy, knowing that there are, there are folks who come in, you know, with quite skepticism, understandably so, until you just let yourself give it a go. You know, so let yourself give it a go and just you're in the driver's seat. Let it let it happen. So uh, here's the setup for the exercise. And I find like an easy one that you might consider uh, just to lean in a bit is just consider this time as one of transition for you. Like um, let yourself sink in to the idea that maybe at this time, or even just let yourself recognize um, how in this time might you be going through a transition yourself? You don't need to know all the answers. You just recognize that I'm going through transition. So here's the invitation. It would be to wander in silence in a place that is surrounded by nature and of nature. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, na a national park. You know, it, it's just you might have others around you. Uh, I'd, I'd ask you not to engage with them. Um, let yourself uh, be in nature and wander until you come into the presence of something in nature that it too has been going through an experience of transitions. And you don't need to be concerned of whether you'd find something. Nature is going through transitions all the time. It, it can be uh, simple things like grasses blowing in the wind. Um, it could be trees where um, pine cones have fallen or branches are dying. It, it, it could be the wind that's passing by. Um, it could be clouds that are dissolving. Um, there's so much, <laughs> actually, that um, you might just notice what is around you going through transition itself. But wander until you come to a particular place or being or thing where you are you are drawn to it. Uh, you just you just notice it. You feel like you're particularly kind of drawn to it. And when you come to this place, um, what I'd offer is that you treat what's about to follow as if you were meeting a friend. So uh, when you come, you might start off by saying and sharing out loud uh, what it is that stands out for you that is going through transition, that brought you here. That, you know, what are you seeing in, in this? It, it might be, well, it, and it might be like this. You find your own words, but it might be, Hey, Tree, I've just come to you because I see that the moss that has been growing for quite some time on your bark is now peeled away over here. And just the way that is and how that showed up, it just, I couldn't help but come over and just to be with you for, for a moment. And so just as you greet a friend, share a little bit about what brought you to them. And then when you're ready, you might just 
let it go and head into sharing your own story or transition at this time, whatever words you use. So it might be, so I'm, I feel like I'm now ready to just talk to you and let you know what I'm going through at this time. And it's like this, then whatever you have to say, and you'll know, you don't have to know in advance, but you'll know uh, where to go, what to say, just let it, let it happen. And when you're done, just like you would in any other conversation, you might have some questions. You might, you might come to a place where there's something really to be said, let that happen. And if it's a question or if, even if it's not, when you're done, you might just pause and be quiet. And just here, is there anything that comes in return, just as in conversation? And let anything that happens next be part of the conversation. It may come from the tree. It may come from your imagination. It's like listen with all you have, your ears, your eyes, your imagination, your intuition. Whatever shows up next, whatever movement, let that be part of the conversation. And continue until you know the conversation's done and what's helpful is to um, end the conversation. It helps to just bring good closure by saying a gratitude or a thank you or a bow, sometimes a touch, what, whatever feels right to you. Let it be normal. You wouldn't just turn from and start walking. So bring it to an end and share whatever it is to be shared and just bring it to an end, kind of a sacred reciprocity of appreciation at that point, you know? Um, and so that, and at that point, what I'd offer just part of the exercise is you might continue, you might go somewhere else, or you might just pause, you might journal for a little bit about what was that experience like, what comes up, what's got your attention now. Um, it's helpful to have like a journal handy. Um, and then when you're done with the whole experience, you might cross a threshold uh, before you head back to a car or a sidewalk at home. It's just pause for a moment before you let yourself hop into the other world let this be a special world um, and pause and just notice the experience sometimes it's a feeling sometimes it's in your body you might put your hand over where that presents in your body and you might even just say yes and take note of what that was and then when you're ready cross over the threshold might be going from the ground to sidewalk could be crossing under a branch whatever it is and then you can go about your day. It just helps to kind of mark it in, uh, that way. So that's that's the exercise. Um, uh, some examples of, of things um, just to make it more real. Uh, so one thing for me, um, I can just share some of the particulars. It's actually one of the first first times I had done anything like this, which for me, this was like what I was definitely one of the folks like what did you just say like speak out loud <laughs> like really okay um i was uh outside of telluride uh, participating in a program and i had been invited to go out and have a conversation with, and maybe some things that might have been part of my early childhood wounds and i had felt like i had had a pretty good childhood really all things considered but it wasn't about that. It, it was more of like, what were the things that might have been significant disturbances? <laughs> or, you know, could I just slow down and really pay attention? And so I didn't know what I was even going to talk about. Uh, but I did start to wander until I came to a place where it felt like there was something in nature where there was a wounding. That, that, you know, like, hmm. So I, I came to this place and there was, um, it was a, uh, an area on the side of a hill and there was um, a cut in the ground and it looked like somebody had taken a shovel, you know, and just started to dig, but it, it just cut uh, in. And it, it, it struck me just because it was so different from other things. And it, it did feel like a cut into like a body. Um, I hadn't had a cut in a body, just to say that directly, but it felt like wounding um, presented that way. So I started to share. And I can't remember the particulars, uh, but I do remember just exploring uh, my own um, stories of what, what could have been. I was just holding it loosely. 
of what, what could have been wounding. Um, there were some things that I, um, that I did bring up. But then I started as the, what I do remember is as I went through the hard things um, to talk about, I also started to see things in a new way. And, and I, I started to feel like what I was exploring started to um, give me some insight into ways that I, I, I didn't know that was part of the deal. <laughs> and I, I started to see some kind of precious things that had happened uh, in my in some early experiences. I do remember talking about it had to do with my first stepdad and the relationship that we had. But I started to see things differently. And when I started to see it differently, I felt different. I looked back at this wounding in the ground. I'm sitting having this conversation with this cut. And what I noticed is that the cut, which had presented like a spade had gone in, was that now it looked like a smile. You know, that was because of the particular cut, like, dude, you're getting it. <laughs> it's like, now you're seeing it. And so that shook me up, you know, and almost like things look doubly, you know, they, 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 and so I, I won't forget that experience of, um, how it just seemed like being with somebody that was quite alive and, and listening in ways that I just hadn't expected. And, um, so that's 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 one personal story of how that had happened. Is, is that helpful, or bring up any other? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's 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 very helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving a, a moment to see if there was uh, any anything else there, and I, I yeah. think maybe just a, a couple of things for the, these are I don't know, just I guess, I guess clearing type of questions for if someone. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine someone might be listening who is say in San Francisco or New York City. And maybe they're really intrigued by what you're saying. And it's, you know, what, what are really the options? Uh, I mean, New York City, and there's, there's parks, of course, in both cities. But if someone is, you know, voicing the concern, I don't really have a great spot to yeah. go in nature. Where, how would they engage with something? How would you invite yeah. them into this? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up because it just makes it more accessible for sure. Um, so one thing to know is, um, there are so many different ways and you might be surprised at what starts to open up to you if you let yourself um, move and um, see what is of nature speaking to you um, and even let the definition of nature um, be, be open. And the reason I say that is so I've done something with uh, some folks on the campus of, of MIT. And so that's it, there's there's there are grounds there are trees uh, there's the the river it's Charles River that that cuts through, but um, it is not a park per se. It's it's not expansive nature. Um, but I was with a, a large group actually, and we did a similar kind of walk uh, with I think it might have been maybe sixty people, and to go out on a relatively short period of time and explore their own transition. And amazing things can happen. Um, it's, if you, the key here is to let yourself just be and let it be um, coming towards you already. <laughs> you it don't have it be an efforting out trying to perform. And um, so that, that's how we kind of set it up as well uh, in the Cambridge example. And people were coming back with just extraordinary stories. And sometimes it was nature's effect on architecture, you know, so pieces that had fallen from buildings, a grass that was growing through cracks of sidewalks, um, trees that are all around. Um, but it was, it was a huge wide array. Um, so just letting that be and um, letting yourself be surprised. If you go out almost like, with where you are in your life, but the openness and curiosity of a younger one of you to, to be that open um, and that, that curious, that can support you as well. And then there's um there's an idea of something called the sit spot, um, but it's I think of it as the idea of just befriending um, something that you're drawn to that is of, of nature and coming to know it quite intimately, uh, which is to almost 
choose to really take on a friend and be a friend too, and to share as you would with a friend over an extended period of time. So I had folks who are in Manhattan um, pick out a tree, for instance, that's growing through the sidewalk and come to know it uh, four seasons of the year <laughs> to go out and spend some time, see how it's feeling, lean against it, you know, and to uh-huh. see it through different times of day, different weather. Um, it, it's that you can do, you know, um, and then, you know, for folks who are really committed and many, it's just more like letting yourself be surprised. You know, there's the different birds and hawks that I mean, different birds that are, come regularly, you know, so letting things slow down and letting it be open in terms of time. Um, maybe it's something for five minutes, but maybe it's something that crosses over five weeks. Um, just what's it suggesting for you? Um, letting it be okay is a big part of it. You know, just letting it be okay and just go out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can, I can sense my kind of my inner Tim Ferriss coming online of like, you know, what's the, what's the right way to do this thing? You know, give me, the, yeah. give me, give me the playbook yeah. and, and the really the invitation uh, the the question that's coming up for me that is if I were to engage in any way with nature or the outside world right now, something, something like, can I let myself be guided by something yeah. when I go on this walk or when I yeah. you know, take this 30 minute time? Right. Uh, and, yeah. and the, the allowance is really the thing and however you engage yes. with the allowance is totally individual. And that's it, right. It yep. doesn't really matter. Yep. <laughs> Yep. That's a great way of putting it. You know, it's, there's so much of this that is about letting yourself have permission. <laughs> In some ways, what I realized, I, I started offering these kinds of exercises for groups and people that had no, they weren't opting in for a nature-based program. Sometimes it was strategy development. Um, it, it was all sorts of things in bit, mostly business contexts that this is not what would be recognized as normal. But what I found is if there's a point in time where there's something that's here and it could benefit from just leaning in in ways that are different from how we've shown up up to this point, mm-hmm. uh, going out and spending time in nature, whether it's a conversation in nature or even just a walk with one or two other people with a seated question to go inquire where it's not it's not math rationally right or wrong question, but go inquire in, into a real question that's here and do that in nature. What, what I found is if I am the one who is just saying, here is the structure we're going to use, and the way of doing it right is to just let yourself do it, you've kind of been able to speak to the, an A student <laughs> offering what constitutes doing it well, but then saying it's up to your imagination, intuition, having somebody else there too, just give them permission. What I I, I remember when I first started doing that, I felt really nervous, like, will, will this be okay? Uh, but <laughs> what I soon dis- what I discovered was, oh, it's actually supporting them to what they already really would love to be doing anyway. So why don't we just get on with it? You know, so the more you kind of tap in with that way, it, it's, 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 it's a different version of giving permission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So I, I wanted to get to like you work with with people on three levels, and, and this is something that we teed up for this conversation. And I, mm-hmm. I think I wanted to spend as much time as possible talking about the wilderness, because I think that that's when it comes to executive coaching, a, a lot of people in the space of executive coaching do work with individuals and teams, right? Yep. Yeah, And that's great. And it's really important work. And working with the wilderness, I think it comes, it engages us in a way that we're not typically, unfortunately, that most of us aren't typically comfortable with being engaged. And that's why yeah. when you when you say speak out loud to a tree, we all go, yeah. what? what the hell are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that about the wilderness that you feel compelled to bring into the conversation before we seg maybe segue into individuals and orgs. Yeah, there, there, yes, there, there are some things just even putting the conversation with nature as just one element and putting that to the Mm -hmm. side and then kind of coming to back, back to nature in a much bigger context. You know, there's, there's something I think that's super supportive of getting out of the context that might um, just present 
images, textures, sounds, colors that are familiar with what it is to be in business or whatever profession you might be. So to, to leave that, whatever that might be, that particular context and go into the context of nature, there, there's often something that just feels supportive even already for many, not for all. Some people get really nervous, especially if you haven't had um, either an established relationship or uh, the relationship you had wasn't good. Um, so to, but what can be there is uh, even if it takes a little bit of effort and support, that's okay. But there can be that I'm, I'm actually in a place that's somehow bigger or beyond this, uh, this, which I might experience in a more confined way, not, not negative, just different. You know, there's something bigger, not better, but different in, in a positive, rewarding way, which just, just serves to help support the person to come into as much as they might a well-resourced self. So that too, you know, and even things like the smell of a ponderosa pine, you know, or looking up at the stars, you know, or feeling or smelling dirt, you know, I mean, Mm. it's, and oftentimes it is sometimes connections with fun experiences as a child or with family or or whatever. So um, it's also free from judgment, you know, might be another thing that's, that's a valuable thing to say. So just, there's, there's a lot that is supportive of nature that we could probably spend tons of time with. But so to add that on top of just conversations with nature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And no, this is, I mean, something else that's, I mean, maybe for, this is going to be one of the key takeaways for myself from this conversation. There's, there's almost a way that, like when I first started to listen to personal development podcasts, read personal development yeah. books, it became a recurring theme to reconnect with nature. And there, there's almost like, one of the things I've really most appreciated about every step of the way that you've taken us during this conversation is you cannot do it wrong. <laughs> you you <laughs> uh-huh. cannot, you have to allow, uh-huh. allow, your, allow yourself. Right. And there's, there's almost a way that I could hear that and still like force myself to be in allowance or something. Right. Like, there, yeah. do, do you get, are you picking up? What yeah. I'm putting down? Like, I, well, yeah. Yeah, maybe just build a bit more on that. So uh, see if it follows the same thread. Um, one is that even considering those kinds of things, I start to get a little bit more gentle and maybe even excited with myself about what this might be. So that's already more in the realm of inviting, which is different from how do I do this right? You know, and um, so that's that's in there. The, the The other thing just to say super directly in ways I feel like we've been talking about it, but it's um, you do not need to perform. You you don't have to earn it. Um, Actually, what you really need to do, really need to do, better listen closely. What you really need to do is you need to be there and it's got to be you and you got to be there. And it's that being present with it. That's the big thing. You cannot, you don't need to train, although practice might be helpful. you might find that your early experiences have certain things. Your later experiences have different, more rich things. It's not about right or wrong. It's just letting whatever happens be okay. Letting that happen, you know? So there's this thing about often I feel it comes with the A student, comes with startup culture in a number of ways, you know, is it's performance, which is off, often, by the way, it's a bit of a thread to the side, but I might just build on this so people could relate to it, is that idea of I need to do it right and then I get the benefit. Mm-hmm. It's like I need, I'm need i going to devote three to five years or longer to my business and then I'll start living. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. no, actually, <laughs> this is not the deferred life plan. <laughs> this is actually, it's here. <laughs> it's waiting for you. You know, you can, but you need to be there. <laughs> just yes. bring yourself and that you can even do that. You can just say, you need to get up to give all yourself the performance words. You know, I'm going to set the alarm. I'm going to write down here the steps. And, and then I'm going to tell myself you need to be out there, but then be there. Yes. <laughs> yes. <You know>? mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. beautiful. So mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. And and now I would love to segue into the way, yeah. I, and I think that they really overlay and the, you know they don't need to be distinctly separate here is, yeah. is the way that you work with individuals and teams and, and nature probably plays a role in, in some of that. But uh, I, I'd just be curious to hear, you seem to have this really uh, invitational, gentle, whatever's here is here. 
let's let's get curious about whatever's here type of presence and that's i, I yeah. think it can be disorienting for the, the a student and the tech startup founder yeah uh, like yep. what are what are some ways that you typically engage with with individuals and teams when when you're working with them? Yeah. Um, well, so part of it is to say I think um, the majority of my work is in this space of support through transition. Um, that in transition that might be even transformative without needing to make it anything. Um, mm. It's and what's important about that is to have it. It's honoring whatever they're they're here to do, what they're ready to do. Um, it's letting them own um, that element of the agenda, um, and it's also to say I'm, I'm working with folks who, by and large, are well resourced, you know, to to be able to do that. Um, whereas um, other people in other situations um, that that might be a bit different, and that that would call for something different. So um, it's funny the part. Of, Part of what I do, whether it's an individual or a group, is that I, I, I'm very much aware that what I'm doing is I'm I, uh, the important part of the beginning is listening. That that what I'm doing is I'm actually trying to understand who are they, what's up, what actually matters for them, how do they see and understand things as they do, and um, and to let that uh, keep presenting itself to the point where we can both kind of see it as so. With, with no judgment and um, w which helps me to just be open because I'm not, um, it's all good. <laughs> that, that phrase drives me nuts. You know, it's all good. <laughs> it, it's like, it's not, <laughs> let's go see what, what what's here, but it's not all for me to, to I, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm fixing or I'm, working things on my way of seeing my way of seeing is to come to understand how they see things and to work with their orientation and what actually matters and often it, it involves something that is keeping them from doing more of what they love and yet something that is drawing them to more of what they what they love and that's stuck <laughs> and so to come to better understand those dynamics at play um, I, I start to see opportunities for re, what I call um, what I think of as actually active reorientation. And it's, it's being intentional about coming to see how I understand and interact and relate to things currently, which sometimes I'll name as like my current movie, or if we start speaking of something that's out there a little bit further, might be new movie, old movie and um, not right or wrong, just, but movies come with experiences, you know, so it's, it's like whole world view. And so I have the experience in the movie, um, but it's a movie. There are other movies and um, being able to develop flexibility that are linked to the individual. It's not just a conceptual scenario. It's actually something that's meaningful. And so that's for, for, for them. I, I, I'm not imposing my movie <laughs> to them. I'm trying to understand what might be an enlivening, thriving movie for them. And those words I often use, things like thriving or flourish, uh, rather than success or achievement, because of the performance-oriented thing. The per One of the things for performance for me, it's not like performance is wrong either. It's just performance, I think, drives a lot of orientation and, and ways of being. And there are things you can be doing to get better in that same orientation, whatever better might mean. But there are things that are beyond it's not instead of it's not in a fight with it's just holds performance plus what are, what's what's the plus part of that that might be beyond and so i start we start working and exploring those things in ways that are enlivening um so the rewarding part to me is seeing somebody who's sparking up <laughs> vitality in what's going on you know um so those those are the things that are that are in play for me. But I'm first part is listening. Next part is starting to engage with something quite real right now. It, it's not oftentimes we'll work with something quite real. And then if it's of interest, I'll share. Here's some of the thinking behind that. But you don't need to know before you get going. In fact, sometimes the most times if you can experience first, you can actually start to develop trust for it. And one of the biggest limiting things in reorienting 
is I'm at risk of letting go of some of the structures and rules and understanding that's kept me safe, kept me loved, and kept me belonging up to this point. Why would I dare to do anything with that? So uh, there we are again with the daring. And the only reason to dare is some sense that there is a, a calling of sorts trying to pull me into it, you know, so we connect yeah. with that. That word daring, I actually wrote it down in my preparation in, in caps here because it seems like it's a, <laughs> it seems like it's a mm -hmm. word that uh, you seem intentional about the choice of the words that you use. Yeah. I think almost any good coach probably is intentional with, with their words and language. And, and so I'm wondering, yeah, when someone is daring into whatever the, the new thing is, what are what are some of the everyone is individual, but I think there there yeah. are through lines of vitality or what makes us come alive when we've already done all the things that were prescribed in our life. And what are what are some of the common threads that you see um, mm. for what we're daring into or what you know what brings us most alive or our vitality? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the really big ones I feel is um individual sense of joy and um how for a variety of reasons uh, different people um may have figured out their own ways of having good enough and incredibly rich but somehow for for some not everybody but for some joy can be an idea that's too hot to touch you know that that it's you know, we can talk about it but to let me actually feel that, you know, now, now we're to have conversations about joy <laughs> often brings that uh, it's, it's uneasy, you know, just, uh, you know, <laughs> fidgety, <laughs> but let's talk about something else, you know, oh, squirrel, you know, off the side. I mean, it's just like, so, um, and, and yet, uh, to just honor that, to just, just, let's just start there. You know, let's just notice what's there, what's up. And often now speaking again in, in broad brush strokes, um, there can be a hesitancy around joy from my perspective for, for folks who have you know, very positive things going. To really talk about joy and joy for them is to get enter into something quite personal where my heart is very much connected with that. And if my heart is really connected, I start telling you, what joy is for me and have that be connected, then I'm putting myself, I run the risk of putting my heart in a vulnerable position and in the danger of heartbreak in, in some ways. And often in some ways where I've experienced it before and it was devastating. Um, and often there, maybe in a younger part of my life where the resources I had and my ability to understand and the awareness I had were something in a very, very different place. Um, but what I learned was kind of the equivalent of don't put your hand on the burning stove, you know? So to then in more of your adult years, be entertaining a conversation, you know, about joy, you know, is, well, maybe we can just keep it heady. <laughs> and then when we start to really think and explore, you know, I, I feel like any kind of thing that's, has thriving in it will have its own version of joy uh, but and the more we might even talk directly about joy we're probably going to talk about some things that are very revealing and helpful um even if folks are have a a comfort in, in openly discussing joy there too you know like great tell me <laughs> you know uh, what comes alive um other things that i've noticed and this is something from covid uh, and I can see it connected to some work done by other people, but I started to notice three things that formed almost like a personal portfolio of very important elements. And um, conveniently, they each started with a C. So um, one is the level of creativity, of self-expression, um, the ability to bring yourself forth in, in what other way. And I think of artistry, but it's not like needing to be literal. It, it's It's letting my own way of being creative be my own way of being creative and that there's a um, that that's really important in thriving is that there is an element that is being addressed and serviced and supported well so that on the creativity bar I'm 
hitting the marker above. And when that starts to sink below, then my world starts to get flat. My, my sense of another C, which starts to speak of contribution and having meaningful contribution into the world. Uh, see, creativity and contribution can overlap all these things. All these three seeds will have their own ways of overlapping. But if I'm just flat, then there's no self-expression. It's what am I doing? Am I just like turning the crank? Am I a cog in a wheel? You know, it's it's all of that. Um, contribution, another one, is to just have meaningful contribution in in a way that is measured and recognized by the individual. Um, is what you're doing somehow mattering to to you in in what you're bringing forth into the world? And seeing the shortcomings of what happens if that dips below a line that is relevant to the individual, and um, and the last one, which is probably the biggest one for me in working with folks through COVID was connection. You know, it's the level of connection and meaningful relationships. And um, it's kind of like sleep, you know, um, if you're not getting it, why don't you do that first? Then we'll talk, <laughs> you know, it's like, what can we do to just start there and have that get to a good place? You know, so connection here too, very, very important and, um, and incredibly personal. You know, it's not it's not a measured quantity it's a quality quantity so um what does that look like for the individual or where sometimes it's there was something important and now it's hurt or gone or something of that sort so exploring connection in the realm of the individual can be revealing uh, there there too and so those things at the individual level really important but similarly some the same kind of things start to show up in groups you know or think about leadership teams and What's going on? And so, you know, a number of these things that start from the level of understanding and depth and awareness of what it is to be a human being as an individual start to show up again in what it is to be human in the context of other human beings. <laughs> and uh, so the work will be there too. It's just one of the big differences I feel is when I'm working with groups or sometimes whole organizations, I, I also lean into, you know, what's the shared sense of purpose that might be the foundation uh, from which we might do something together. Um, where, especially in cases where it's either assumed or totally part of the deal that we have this belief that what we can do together is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, if it's just mechanical, then probably I'm not a fit. <laughs> I should probably go find somebody else. Um, but when we're trying to do something that comes from our actually being together, then, then I get really curious uh, and, and start leaning into um, often competing forces where one foot's on the gas and the other foot's on, on the brake. Well, we can do that at the individual level too. You know? When someone, so that, I mean, first of all, those are all beautiful to explore mm -hmm. contribution, to explore joy, connection. And the first one, forgive me, what was the first seed? Creativity, creativity. Yeah. Those are, yeah. mm -hmm. those are huge and they, they all resonate a lot with me. And mm -hmm. there was, when we were talking about someone getting squirmy with joy and, and that maybe it was the equivalent of something we learned of the putting your hand on the hot stove, right? Like we don't get to, it's not safe yeah. to express that thing, that tender vulnerability here. It feels like one of the most important things we can do as coaches or guides is to to meet that, you know, call it resistance or that squirminess with a, a level of love. And yeah. um, I'm just, I'm wondering if there's any, um, if there's any models or maps or, or ways that you find useful to engage when, when someone is squirmy around any of these things, they can, they can come across as squishy, especially if we continue to focus on the yeah. high performer who just like needs to achieve <clears throat> yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's, here's something that I often bring up. Um, com compassion becomes a part of this for sure. Uh, but um, sometimes in some conversations, when, especially when things are stuck or if the person's really depleted um, or even conversations around burnout start to show up. One of the things that I feel, especially for genuinely regularly well-resourced folks, when burnout starts to show up, it's often it, it can often be an indication of there's something I com I'm committed to, but there's also something that's not quite square about this that I haven't quite resolved. And so here I am 
try and do my best when I'm actually trying not to make it happen at the same time, because there's there's something not quite right about this. And that, that gets into this whole space. Uh, a number of folks have called, um, it totally fits here, competing commitments, internal competing commitments. And um, But there's also something that can be helpful at that point to start turning towards what I think of as fears, worries, and concerns. And what I find helpful about this is we can start talking about it. <laughs> and so when I uh, offer this up, I offer a spectrum of fears, worries, and concerns, because then I don't have to arm wrestle myself. Is that really a fear? I don't know. You know. So if you just let it all be fears, worries, and concerns, you might imagine a spectrum where on the one hand, it might be just a smaller bit of a concern. Maybe that might be pushing it. Um, on the other end, outright terror, fear, you know, <laughs> like, However, I might respond to that in whatever ways, and we'd all recognize that. Um, fears, worries, concerns, what I, what I think is then heading into a conversation around fear. Just call that whole spectrum fear. That would be knob turned down, knob way up there. Um, and in fears, what I've seen that is a super helpful thing is I've noticed that in fear, there are three things that are present. And they need to have these three things to come into fear. So one of them is that there's something that actually matters to me. And if it didn't matter to me, <laughs> I wouldn't be caring a fear, worry, or concern about it. So check. Next thing is that which matters to me um, is, is about to get hurt or annihilated or taken away. It's, it's like that thing that matters has a bullseye on its back. And so it's in the process. It's, it hasn't happened yet. But this this is what's about to happen, and it's bad. Um, that's the second thing. Something bad about to happen that matters. Third is that which is about to matter is beyond my agency to do something adequately to stop it from happening or to address the impact of that. It's beyond my agency. So in the fear scenario, that's kind of the setup. Um, but what we can do with fear is we can, and it's hard to do alone. I think it's to you can do this with somebody who's not having that same experience, but might understand what you're going through is you might get super curious. And I think of it as befriending fear. It's not to make fear like a jolly good thing. It's to name it what it is, but then get curious about it and to really start to get intimate with what might be happening. Because if we can really lean in to see what's going on here, I might actually see what it really matters to me that's in this. And if I can take that which matters and take it out of the fear experience and take it to the side, I can bring my agency back to that. And when that happens, things can spark up incredibly quickly. So a quick example, um, I was working with someone back in maybe halfway through COVID where they were seeing they would need to do a reduction in force. And um, this for this leader, it was a terrible thing. Uh, to go through. And when we were talking about it, what I could hear where he was coming from, what he was going to do, which wasn't going to be a bad thing, is he got to this place where he was just going through the numbers and seeing what was required. And that made these things part of what was was were the necessary next steps. And it, it just felt like he had distanced himself from what was going to be there. And he's rationally engaging with it all. But the rest of him isn't present. So we stop and, and just, yep, this, this will be happening. So just that there was a reduction in force just to share the ending of that. It doesn't change the realities, but to go in and to really get curious. So what, what are you most concerned about here? What really matters to you in, in going through? So then he started to tell me about the people and the people who had been there for quite some time and the impact on the families and that he, what he wanted is to just make sure that those people knew how valuable um, they had been and what, what they meant. He said, that's the deal. And, he, you know, he, he was getting emotional as he was telling this to me. And I can feel that now, even just sharing that with you, you know. And so now we're starting to talk about what really matters. And you can see how it's individual. But as soon as he did, he showed up. He started bringing himself. And I said, okay, so now what I can see is that the people matter to you. In, in this one. And even saying that might be too abstract. When we talk about laying people off, 
you have names and families. So they matter. So if they matter, how do you want to go about doing this now, knowing that they matter? And then he went on to just, whew, like he started telling me. <laughs> it didn't change the outcome, but it changed the relationship and orientation of the whole thing. So he wasn't in the handcuffs of fear anymore. You know, he, he found his own way by mining fear for what actually mattered and bringing his agency back to it. So, so that's, that, that can show up, you know, in places, especially when, you know, I'm trying to head towards something better, but I'm, I'm on my heels. Uh, it's a bit much at this time or more, you know, mining fear. To me, it does. It does feel like a, a good. There's there's a million threads that we could continue to unspool yeah. here, right? And I yeah. think I think that uh, something I'm noticing about the way that I'm conducting these conversations now is I I'm craving more and more depth. Like I I feel like I awesome. can go three three hours uh -huh. in every single conversation, and mm -hmm. and uh, there there might be a part two in our future at some point. Mm -hmm. But for now, given given the mm -hmm. time constraints that we that we set for this mm -hmm. one and uh, I've got a, a nice lunch ahead of me. I, nice. I would love to yeah. just, you know, see if, if there's anything that we have spoken about so far that you feel unfinished with that you want to circle back on. And if not, there's a couple of curiosities that we can go yeah. to to bring this, this conversation to a close. I, I don't really. I mean, I don't feel like there's what I am aware of. It's what you just mentioned of just like, you know, we could go into this whole thread over here, you know, but uh, it'd be a bigger thing. Um, and there isn't really the need to do that. Um, no, let's see if I, if I. The, the thing that's more of a question than a sense is almost like. Um, I'm not checking anything, but it, knowing what you love to do. And uh, what your um, your audience uh, loves to engage with is is there anything that uh, would be a helpful maybe even a wrapper or you know another connection point not not as an additional thing necessarily if there is there's that's too but I've seen anything that draws this together in a way that's that's helpful that you you I'm not feeling like there's a need to do that but you might have a sense for that just given what you do and mm. who loves mm. you your work <laughs> yeah yeah well this is maybe a direct answer to your question but mm -hmm. i i find so engaging with some of the stuff that you brought into but really everything in this conversation actually like having a conversation with nature or uh really just being open to guidance of some kind without me being yeah, a lot of times I, especially early on, I would find myself going into, we'll say, a coaching engagement or a workshop thinking, how many new clients will this get me? Or mm -hmm. like, what's the specific results that I will achieve? And something that I'm more and more falling in love with is, is just for the allowance of the unfolding. And one vehicle for me that I think is something that you're interested in, because I've heard you speak about David White and, and Mary Oliver and, and maybe other poets yeah. before. Like one one portal that we can get to open ourselves to our creativity or to be more feel more connected to ourselves or others is through arts and, and poetry. And yeah. uh, maybe this this could be a, a neat way to to really move to a close here. Are there any any lines from favorite poets or or any, or maybe it's just poets in general that you'd invite us to check out. Wow, that's a great question. I don't know if you knew this or not, but um, like poetry has been such an important part along the way that I put together a collection of, of poems that actually map to the different uh, parts of the, of the journey. Mm. So um, sometimes it just comes up in a conversation where I can't not think about a poem that just feels like it's it's here. Um, so as you ask about this question i kind of went the way of answering is i just kind of feel into what comes up and i think of i like my attention goes to um yeah, here's a poem yeah. it's uh everything is waiting for you you know which is um I, what brought me to this poem and, and at this moment is 
thinking about folks who just might be um, heading into this or have some words that came from our conversation that struck a chord for them that maybe they might uh, start to consider that they might be in this place and it might be helpful without even having answers to those, just those questions yet even. Um, but there's a poem by David White called Everything is Waiting for You, uh, which um, starts out with words that are something like, "Your great mis- the great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone, something like that, you know? And um, so, and then there's a line that's further into it that says, um, alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. And what what I, these two lines in this poem, um, first one is you might be experiencing a moment where I feel like it's all on me and I, I'm kind of disconnected or at worst isolated. Um, and it brings up the way I see the world around me. These two are somehow related, uh, isolation and what's happening. But that's not necessarily needing to be um, a, a, a movie that you might really want to be ex- engaging in at this or indulging in even. Um, it certainly is understandable <laughs> um, that you might feel that way for sure. And I'd want to hear about that. Um, that. As the poem goes further, though, this idea of alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. For me, I thought this is by David White, the whole poem is, but I'm like, dude, that is, those are some jam packed. <laughs> words going to, I had to slow that one down and think that one through a bit more and what it was coming up for me is so often we can be in relationship to what's happening but what's actually playing out is what we're already familiar with so I miss what's actually here and it well I might have so much of a movie about what's already going on and it, everything is confirmation bias to fit what I'm already expecting can I can I be so fill in the blank, almost like uh, compassionate with myself, uh, so curious about what might be here that I might, that might be a seed for me, can be so curious as to s- slow down and become alert to see something that actually isn't expected in the familiarity of what's here. And so it's like, whew. And then, then as it goes on, I, we come to this place in the poem where everything is waiting for you, you know? It, it's so... Here we are, you know, um, could we, maybe we're leaning in and seeing that I have been living out some, some things, but maybe there's a different way. And, uh, reading that poem might actually help open things up as well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. well, thinking of all the different ways you can kind of shake your snow globe, if you will, like shift yeah. our context, <laughs> right? Shift our yeah. context so that we are, we, we might see something different or have the mirror right. reflected in a different way. And and this conversation touched on a lot of different ways we might do yeah. so. And poetry is a beautiful avenue if you're not privileged enough yeah. to be able to say travel or right. work with a coach. Those you know, those can be a little bit on the pricier side, but poetry can help yeah. us really shift into some other context without having to actually move it at all. And yeah. uh, beautiful theme of the conversation today. Yeah. I think a couple other things just because of opening it up to see what might be connections for others. Um, music. Awesome. Yes. You know, yes. you know, and, and, but to really let it move you, you know, so uh, if it's turn it up or turn it down, you know, I mean, you know, what, what, what is it to actually further lean in or to have it really rip through you, you know, and to dance, to move it, to sing out loud, you know, to, to to just let yourself have that experience and notice what's coming, you know, uh, from that could be joyous, amazing music could be deeply depressing grief laid music. You know, it's what, what's that time for, you know, what's it time for without needing to know where you're going. Um, and then things like um, colors, crayons, markers, blank pages, <laughs> thinking about Nathan and I was thinking, or, or walls, but you know, you might want to think about that, but just, just picking up some colors and moving it someplace. And, you know, it, it's, 
it's not needing to be art gallery level or, you know, <laughs> do your own art gallery, you know, <laughs> invite whom you've ever, you know, get some folks to do it with you. I guess this is another important part is so much of what's in here, I feel, is importantly individualized and individualistic in, in its important ways. But I don't think it's it's work we shouldn't be doing alone. So it's individual work we shouldn't do alone. And, and that's that's you don't need to, you know, bring others, find your posse, yeah. <laughs> like bring them along. <laughs> yeah. So that's there, too. You know? Right on, Jim. Right on. <laughs> So before before my final question, uh, I know you've got a, a page on Reboot where folks can connect with you, and I'll, I'll link to the Journey of Transformation essay that you wrote. Is that available online? Yeah, it's there's a, a version of it through um, On Being. It, it's still available there. It was published there a couple of years back, and um, you can find it there online too. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are there other places you would invite folks to check out to engage with what you're up to? Um, so I've, I've written a couple of articles that are also through Medium, and then I'm trying to just be more attentive to posting some of these things and make them digestible in in more LinkedIn kinds of ways as well. So that that'll be more forthcoming. Awesome. All right, Jeff. Great. And the uh, the final question that I ask in every interview is: uh, Well, the podcast is called Mike's Search for Meaning, and I would love to know. Maybe a little bit about Jim's search for meaning. The, the question is, uh, what for Jim constitutes a meaningful life? Yeah. Um, I, well, in a simple way, it's like tending to what matters, <laughs> but letting that be incredibly personal and maybe a lifelong inquiry, but to be active in, uh, in, in doing that. I feel like that's a, a nice short succinct way of speaking at a relatively high level and for me more particular it's it includes family mountains lots of time outdoors um time with i was just thinking of my dog otis you know mm -hmm. that's, like bring them all in let them all be here too um yeah it, it's and things that continue to pull me into um, more learning uh, like continuing to grow I think it's a really important mm -hmm. too. So I'd say those are the highlights for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. You know, something that we didn't talk about in, in our, we'll maybe call this a part one conversation. We didn't engage with family too much or, or fatherhood. Mm -hmm. and, and those are actually two things that I really wanted to, to speak mm -hmm. to you about. And, uh, you know, I, I really experienced you to be someone who brings just a, a lot of care uh, and, and love into his life. And uh, mm -hmm. our shared friend, Jen Cody, described you as an oracle. And yes. uh, I, I love that description mm -hmm. for you, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. a real wisdom that you bring and, uh, and kind of a, how would I phrase this? An openness to the experience and openness to the, the curiosity would be another word, like a real genuine curiosity about, wow, like what's what's here for this person or what's, what's here in nature? What really what's yeah. here seems to be this, this kind of question that you're bringing into a lot of your life. And it's a beautiful way to engage with life. It's something that I'm more and more leaning into mm -hmm. is, is to not uh, act with such certainty that I know how things are going to unfold and to engage with everything in my linear mind. It's to really be open to, the, the beauty of, uh, you know, if what David White is pointing to there, that if I'm stuck in my own lens of the world all the time, I'm going to be missing out on so much other beauty that's here. And yeah. you seem like a presence that invites that in. And mm. uh, I appreciate that gift that you shared with me and, and our audience mm. today. Yeah, thank you. It, it, well, there's one more aspect that this makes up what makes for a meaningful life. I, I feel like... Uh, you just brought this up um, to help me say it so directly, but it's like, let, let the ones that matter to you know that you love them, you know, to mm -hmm. just let them know. Like, I just feel like that's an important practice. It's, it's not a to-do list. It's like, <laughs> get, get that into the practice, man. Yes. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, to everyone who's mm-hmm. listening, just wishing you a, a joyous, even if that makes you a little bit squirmy, wishing you a, a joyous <laughs> rest of your day or evening, mm-hmm. sending you lots of love and take good care. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to Mike's Search for Meaning. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, share this episode with your friends, and leave a review. I look forward to seeing you next time, my friends. And until then, stay safe, stay well, and keep living with purpose. Peace.